here we are. The first episode. <laughs> first episode yeah, yeah. of our uh, attempted podcast. We're going to keep trying. Um, noise podcast. Yeah. <laughs> another noise podcast. But... Not another noise <laughs> podcast. No. So close to naming it that. No. This is Waste of Tape. And um, we hope with this that our, I guess, unique take or approach to this is that, we, you know, we want to make it. We want to make, um, you know, this music approachable for people. We don't want people to feel like you have to already be in the know or be like an industrial noise fan to just check out these albums. You know, these are, these might be heavy or harsh or, you know, outsider or experimental albums to people who aren't used to it. But they, you can always listen to it and check it out and know that there's always like a story or a reason for, you know, people making this. Even like the heaviest, craziest album, there, there was passion and thought and, you know, all kinds of things poured into it. You could listen to a Harsh Noise Wall, Werewolf Jerusalem, <laughs> Richard Ramirez album, and there's still a lot of thought and care and love put into that. There's a reason for making that. So that's what we hope to do with this. Just entice people to check it out and spread the word. And also maybe showcase albums that even within the sphere of the genre and fans just aren't talked about enough as they should. Or albums that, you know, we feel just should be listened to more or talked about more <laughs> um so yeah <laughs> and it won't always strictly be noise or harsh noise i think too at this podcast we want to discuss things that even albums that i think maybe if you're like a fan of power electronics industrial noise um even like really hard techno that you might want to check out um i think even people who are into like black metal dungeon synth all that could also be just wanting to check that out it all interconnects to each other <laughs> eventually uh maybe a hardcore edm episode <laughs> oh, shit. we're gonna have a gather yeah i'll talk about that on here i don't care <laughs> some um, trons <laughs> so yeah and then yeah so i am you know this machine kills music yeah i run the channel i make attempted video essays on all about this stuff and talk about it and then my coho who's this who are you? <laughs> I am No Eyes Fiend or Noise Fiend, and uh, I make hardcore, industrial, cosmic noise, uh, just general, you know, workout music. So <laughs> uh, work. I've been, <laughs> I've been uh, doing that for a while, and uh, this is, I think, this is my third or fourth stream with you. Uh, covering so. different aspects of like industrial and noise culture so. i think so and there'll be many more to come <laughs> it's fun because i feel like these genres are in such a wide spectrum especially industrial genre you get like over one spectrum you get into like the pe noise this crazy dark ambient death industrial stuff and then the other end you get like agrotech and ebm electronic body music and all this stuff and just crazy hardcore acid all this and i think we our interests fill both end of the spectrum we're coming from different angles and i think that's that's good <laughs> definitely a uh, service foil so yeah <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah so like i said it's first episode so you know excuse any issues technical issues presentation we're gonna try to figure out as we go doing this raw <laughs> with some editing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So before we get into every album, <laughs> uh, you know, we kind of want to do uh, like the noise extra thing where they're like, oh, what have you been into? What are you listening to lately? Um, which I mean, I think it's really great. And I feel like I ca we kind of want to like recommend specifically maybe Bandcamp releases are very like unknown or small releases that um, if you are interested in this album or like this stuff that, you know, you might like um, this stuff just to check out um so yeah uh i have two this week or this week this episode <laughs> um and, whoa we're doing this every week uh i don't <laughs> freudian slip no no I, I have no idea when these will come out we're pretty very busy people <laughs> yeah we got uh server compilations and uh solo albums to do <laughs> yeah so. 
know, we're both in intense careers, I'll say, especially with the landscape. Yeah. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so he has three, I have two. Let's go. <laughs> what are your wrecks? What are we starting with? Okay, to... so um, you're going to hear this word later on in the review, and I'll put it here now. Bukla. Um, my first wreck is uh, Cali Malone, Cast of Mind. Uh, so with each of my recommendations, I tried to keep it within the last uh, two to five years, like that range. So now on back to five. And uh, this really pushed it. This album came out in 2018. Um, it's a bass heavy ambient and experimental music. Nice. It prioritized the use of a Bukla 200 synth, <laughs> uh, to create unique movements that devastate your psyche and soul. Um, it's a very powerful album. Um, I listened to it on low while I was going to sleep, but I had to wake up because just the pristine quality of the sound demanded the confrontation of my waking consciousness. <laughs> so it's, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a really intense album, um, despite how simplistic it might sound in different moments. Um, just cumulative, uh, cumulatively, I, I love this album. Um, I believe I immediately, like after finishing it, went and bought a copy nice. <laughs> on Bandcamp. It's it's wonderful. It, it's good when you get those albums that like pull you out of it. Like you you, you listen to it and like it literally pulls you, makes you pay attention. Like that's when you know um, that's an album. That's a good album. It's, that's a rare but special experience. So I have not listened to that one, but I'll check it out, especially because it's got the the bukla. The bukla? <laughs> oh yeah, bukla. What a, what a synth. What a thing. <laughs> <laughs> you just gotta say that. Like, for me, it's like that, and like, you mentioned like the EDP Wasp, and I'm, I'm there. I'm gonna check it out. I'm, I'm ready. Oh, please tell me you're gonna get a <laughs> Behringer Wasp clone. We have the, the Jasper uh, clone, but I'll probably get the Behringer. Dude, that thing is... I have a Wasp shirt. It's great. I love that thing. Nice. Um... That if you want to know why it's great, it's that's like the White House, um, basically synth. There's there's plenty of other albums, but you know, for this, I'll just quickly say why it's awesome. All right, uh, so my first suggestion, um, I think both my suggestions came out this year actually, is uh, actually a um, artist I follow on Twitter. They're a very interesting uh, person, and what I like about them is this is a person who has a high appreciation for ambient like music like deeply respects it loves it um they just are a very chill cool person and it really reflects into their music um they even got their own boom cat list so you know they're legit <laughs> um this is residual energy boss self-titled on Bandcamp, and i think cd copies are still available uh oh i don't think i have mine near me but it's just um a lot like the moments in this album we'll talk about. There's, there's some ambient moments in this album. This is like that wonderful, like warm drone, noisy, fuzzy, um, ambient. Um, I always think of like Alluvium, Chubby Wolf, uh, Belong, October Language. If you like that kind of stuff, um, you should totally check this out. This is someone who like deeply loves making the music they do and puts a lot of care into it and i this is like one of the probably one of the best ambient albums i've heard in a while and definitely for this year I, it'll be hard to top this one um it's just really good really beautiful and yeah i can tell you that there's i feel like some people just like noise they approach ambient with like oh you know it's ambient tape loops da 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 this but to make it ambient i think you have to like actually really love it and respect it and i feel like i follow like dj and techno twitter and stuff and there's like a lot of like memes and just like disrespect towards ambient which i get it sometimes so it's funny and like there's always people making fun of like field recordings and birds and all that stuff but um well this person always like defends it and it's great because it should be so it's it's awesome <laughs> so yeah residual energy boss self-titled great fuzzy warm drone ambient all right uh you you're you got you got three of them 
<laughs> All right. Um, I will say I did check out Residual Energy Boss. Uh, yeah, that album is wonderful. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so my second one, I apologize because they are pretty big. They're <laughs> known. Fine. They're pretty well known. Um, it's Kaelin Mikla Undir Kodam Norojosum, which I butchered that because I don't know Icelandic, but God, yeah, goth rock queens. Um, I still gotta check so, this out. Yeah, this sounds epic. <laughs> yeah, uh, the so the title translates to Under the Cold Northern Lights, and it's so <laughs> fitting. Um, I've not heard a single song from this trio that didn't immediately transport me into the middle of a vast dark and winterscape where I could only see like what the cosmos choose to illuminate. Um, it's synthesized drums, whispering vocals combined with shrill but sparse screams, uh, some powerful bass lines, and just clean synth notes cutting through the mix. So this is a tour de force of barren snowy lands and it is a so cold like this there's not a warm spot in this album. It's yeah, it's it's an icebox of an album. <laughs> I, literally like the opposite of the album I just suggested, which is okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> like, great. <laughs> like you should listen to Residual Energy Boss and buy a CD of that and then go listen to Kaylen Mikla. <laughs> that album is totally warm. Yeah, and then this nice just fruit. I like that. I like an icebox. <laughs> it's the duality of man. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to check that out. I have heard um you we had talked about that album before. I still need to check it out. I heard other people now talking about it, like too. Like it's it sounds crazy. <laughs> All right. And so, what do you got for your second recommendation? <laughs> uh, album I'm listening to a lot. It'll probably be my top of the year too. It's just fun. Um, for me, I when I think of modern industrial, I think it lives on in like heavy techno for me. I love dark, heavy stuff, thick, like, lies, um, and for me, this album is Michael Burdon, Michael Burdon, The Demon, and it came out of Face Tapes, of all things, which is uh, a Minnesotan label that puts out, like, Allegory Chapel and noise reissues, and they put out this album, which, um, I guess you could say it's, it's techno, I techno, but this is, like, he industrial to the max fucking pumping industrial like if you love anything on like fucking lies dj speed stick uh bayo wayne's or any of that stuff you'll this is totally up your alley this is up my alley um <laughs> this is the total like fun uh sue sings another artist that comes to mind this is that kind of that kind of stuff right here oh i love it <laughs> just heavy hard hitting thumping and it's also like noisy still an aggressive industrial it's great <laughs> Why didn't cyberpunk yeah. have music like this? Come on, for real. At least... <laughs> I mean, they had health. <laughs> I mean, if you like health, you'll like this album. That's a good point, I think. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, uh, yeah, Michael Verdon, the demon on Phase Shapes. Um, yeah, it's a local label and he works really hard on the pressings and reissues, so uh, I don't think he was disappointed. He also does reissues of the Rita on the same label, so think of like that in tech i guess so like it's it's a fun time so you, um get that on Bandcamp. yeah and uh this machine had uh like let me know about that album uh shortly uh, no day of its yeah. release and it's one that i bought uh this past Bandcamp friday it's pretty pretty awesome <laughs> nice all right. Oh, what's your what's the last thing you want to pitch before we get into this album? <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, continuing on that trend of like just hard hitting music is uh, one eight hundred pain. That's yeah. the artist. That album is called Their Money Is Your Money, and holy crap, uh, <laughs> this is brutal industrial noise. Uh, that has all of the energy of modern hyper pop, but all the crunchy production <laughs> value of like late '90s or early 2000s industrial hardcore. It it fucking goes, man. Um, yeah. yeah. The <laughs> the vocals are a smearing ghastly facade over blasting drums of hellacious beats. Uh, it's 
as more distortion, more kicks. Everything is more and more and more, and it's all over the top with each track. And like, yeah, I've I've listened to this album a few times now, and I fucking I love it. It's so high energy. Uh, definitely the opposite of like my other two wrecks and of the album we're about to talk about. So. Yeah, but it's worth mentioning. I listened to like a little bit of it. I still listen to the whole thing. It's yeah, it's crazy. I'm kind of surprised it's not been release to the open and become like kind of a certain status like other like i don't know i don't want to be like death yeah. grips but like yeah like it's... <laughs> no i i i agree like if you're a fan of death grips or 100 gags oh, or yeah, just, just... <laughs> anything hyper or even like the you know atari teenage riot and like yeah, the other like you know digital true. hardcore you know like 1-800 pains up your alley you should definitely check it out I think they'll get the. I don't know. I think they'll eventually just get that random break or someone should. Then they'll be the floodgates will open. I think. Yeah, so. <laughs> they they really need it because they uh like their social media presence. I checked them out a little bit on socials and yeah, they're they're pretty fun and crazy on their socials too. Nice. <laughs> well, okay. Well. You know, that's uh, kind of what we want to do to show you. We'll link everything down below. Um, I think this should all be on Bandcamp. Like, oh, yours are all... Yeah. Yeah, so we'll try We'll try to stick the Bandcamp thing so they're easily linkable. Check them out. Um, but, yeah. So check those out, and then, yeah, stick around, and let's get into this album. <laughs> so. so, yes. Um, so I figured... Uh, although I think this was kind of... You brought this album up too as a choice, which I agree is a really good album to start with. So this album um, is a is a well known album within the industrial power electronics noise scene. In fact, is considered a probably one of the earliest or like power electronics album, or one of the first examples of it, as you know, as we know it as modern power electronics. Um, but I think it still needs a bit more respect because I think it comes in passing and people name drop it, but they don't fully talk about what makes it so like good and interesting because it is important. And that is uh, Ramla's Hole in the Heart. <laughs> Classic alert. And originally put out on Broken Flag, the legendary Broken Flag um, label. And I mean, that label deserves its own video entirely because it's a very important label uh the crux of just bringing noise like very specific heavy noise early pe sound to just the genre in general pivotal is the word <laughs> yeah it kind of uh shaped what power electronics and industrial became later on which I know he was informed by like consumer electronics and White House and stuff like that, but I feel like his reach was a little bit better with Broken Flag than it was, you know, with the former acts listed. Yeah. So who are we talking about? I'm trying to see if I can pull up a picture. Yep. <laughs> the... We are t talking about the indomitable <laughs> Gary Moondy. Gary Mundi, or Mundi, I say Mundi because I'm, I'm crazy like that. <laughs> there he is, look at that, you <laughs> picture. This is talking all about Broken Flag, but um, yeah, you know, this was somebody who, he was originally in a post-punk band, um, I... <laughs> I always forget what it was called, and I should have wrote it down, but he was in a post-punk band, and then he saw uh, White House, the very first White House um, performance, and, and if you don't know, White House, William Bennett, Philip Best, lots of other people, sorry William Bennett, in and out crazy, just when people think of Power Electronics, they think of White House. Um, you've probably seen, I think, why he never became a dancer is kind of like a viral video on YouTube. Sometimes if the <laughs> algorithm picks it up for some reason, every every couple of years, yeah. people are like, "Oh my god, this music is so weird." Um, you know, a lot of people probably know clipping, clipping samples White House pretty often. They had a whole EP, the Wriggle EP, which is sampling them, Wriggle like an eel. Uh, yeah, that's White House considered, you know, a cornerstone, corner pillar of electronics. So it's it makes a lot of sense that. 
uh, you know, Gary. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll go and see um, the first performance of White House, which that is its own story on its own. Just it was crazy. It was a crazy show, and obviously he was influenced by that because he's like, you know, this is crazy. This is you know what I want to do. It's one of those moments that a lot of musicians have. If you read a lot of like autobiographies and stuff, where they're like, this is what I wanted to do with my life, and he had that epiphany seeing William Bennett and. Yeah, and that's what he went on to do, and he went on to start the Broken Flag label, um, which is actually a Patti Smith song, I believe. Broken Flag. <laughs> Funny enough, and I'm trying to look up the... He's definitely someone that uh, isn't afraid of, you know, like, wearing his influences on his sleeve, you know? Yes, uh, absolutely. Like paying homage. Ah, his original band was called A Cruel Memory. I always forget that. Let's check that out. So he went from A Cruel Memory to Making Broken Flag and then creating his band Ramla, which I pronounce Ramla, which I'm going to pronounce it that, so I apologize if it's Ramla or Ramla or Ramming. It's your stream. You get to, you get to pronounce it however you want. <laughs> That's right. Uh i edit that i just lost my train of thought <laughs> but <laughs> that's fine i'll figure i'll probably rewatch this entire stream and cut it up see so you to mention him but so yeah uh and they have quite a few albums and i th think are they still putting out music is gary still making music yeah, I believe he's still making music. Um, I'm not sure if he put it out on Broken Flag, but I want to say he had an album out within the last 10 years. Mm. Which means they're, they're still active. Someone puts out an album within the last decade. <laughs> yeah, uh, Broken and Beaten in 5-8 time. Uh, let's see. That was as uh, Kleisvar, so mm. yeah, he's still active uh, under various different uh, monikers and uh, under different, you know, names, yes. <laughs> different performance <laughs> groups. Oh yeah, he's still in there. Um, so yeah, <clears throat> this album, A Hole in the Heart, uh, which if you've... I feel like there's at least two guides I've seen where people are like, if you want to like get into power electronics, um, they usually or there's probably a few guides that say like check out Hole in the Heart. I feel like that shows up a lot, you know, and with <clears throat> with good reason because it's a very it's a very unique album even in like the PE sphere. It's kind of its own entire entity and it's it's pretty crazy. Um, and I feel like it paved a way for a lot of different sounds too, because it just has this very unique, intense, fuzzy drone, which as far as, I mean, I could be completely wrong, but as far as I'm aware, it wasn't that common uh, when this album came out. Yeah, um, at the time of this release, it was pretty like unusual for there to be any sort of, um, you know, like, just straight up drone straight up uh fuzzy i guess music <laughs> um yeah <laughs> it was it, you know it was pretty much like you had you had the beginnings of the ambient world and like the very early like i don't want to call it trance but like that style of music um because i mean stuff like throbbing gristle had been around for a while already but um the old school like you're holding a single note for multiple measures or even you know throughout an entire performance like that stuff hadn't really been in any sort of resurgence since the like middle ages um <laughs> so you know like uh unless you want to start really getting into the fine particulars of like what is this type of music yeah. that type of music and stuff like um you can still look at this and say for its release date it's very unusual i mean plenty of artists have been playing around like obviously ambient can be traced back to like 
very long time ago, even like NBA, as we know it, modern NBA can be traced back to 50s and 60s, but the way this album um, just blends, it's not just, it's like ambient, early power electronic vocals, the drone, the guitar, the synthesis, the way it's layered, it's so interesting, and there isn't any, there's not many albums still that are quite like it, um, it's definitely its just own interesting entity, and I think in this, you know, in this podcast, we're going to kind of go in probably track by track and kind of just recap our feelings and notes and just why this album, you know, you should listen to and is very interesting. <laughs> Because interesting it is, um, it, it's pretty it's pretty amazing that he made this, which I believe it was pretty much a whole, uh, he made this by himself, basically, or because Ramla albums had a few other people with him, but this one in particular, specifically A Hole in the Heart, was by himself, I do believe. Yeah, he, um, he said in an interview with um, The Quiet Is, he said that, he had to make this album alone because uh, the two years leading up to its release, like no one else wanted to do Ramley with him. Like it, it was all him. So yeah. uh, this is like, as besides the samples, this is as far as he's told everyone, all him. This is like a pure look into his psyche during a time of uh, creative loneliness because no one else was working with him. I mean, and that makes sense too because um, there's like, there's a lot of like keywords that come to mind when you listen to this album. Like loneliness is one. For me, it's like, this album is just like pure anxiety. Yeah, loneliness, stressed. Um, you definitely, like you can physically hear and like feel it too when you listen to it like this album like <clears throat> this is one of the few albums I legitimately like you hear what it feels like to have a panic attack I guess is the best way to put it completely like you can hear the heaviness on your chest you can just hear the pressure and stress and the breakdown um so kind of keep keep that in mind when <laughs> coming into this album that's what how I feel but doesn't mean it's not a very enjoyable listen because it is so i guess um we can start going in and to be specific we're talking about uh we were listening to the uh re-release that came out in 2009 on dirter promotions um and dirter or dirtier or dirter promotions i never know how to pronounce it dirter i think yeah <laughs> yeah which is a good label um they put out a lot of reissues of like white house and stuff they do a good job i have quite a few of their reissues and this one's really good this is the um double cd and it it has a different track listing to the original release but i think it has some reworkings and extra songs that couldn't originally be released and this is definitely like the way i think to listen to this album like this is the definitive way to listen to hole in the heart <clears throat> yeah this uh this re-release is it's almost or more than double the track listing but that just expands the concept more specific uh specifically with the tracks um i want to say it's red caps yeah the red yeah there's... yeah the red cap part one through uh six, six. yeah so, yeah <laughs> absolutely um yeah, and it's a pretty solid, like, feeling and vibe, like, completely through. I know sometimes, like, when people, like, reissue stuff, uh, especially from, like, the 80s to, you know, 2010s, that, like, stuff can be lost. But, nope, this this improves it. it. It, you know, makes the story bigger, the feelings bigger. It's just, it's very good. Um, uh, and um, the audio-wise, because I did find a cassette rip, I, I want to say, like, they were pretty true in holding the original sound with the, uh, at least, you know, I don't have a physical copy of either, yeah. but at least with the digital copies that I have of both, like, it holds going from, you know, 87 to 09. So, like, yeah. the degradated sound, the... Uh, <laughs> lo-fi yeah, lo <laughs> recording yeah 
this is um I guess we should kind of slightly clarify when we say like, um, you know, power electronics or industrial or whatever, if you go into this thinking you're going to get like White House or consumer electronics or something from Tesco, that's not the case. This is, this is definitely like a lo-fi, fuzzy, just analog, analog yeah. very, very analog experience, um, which, which is good. So, but, yeah. um, <laughs> Yeah, I've got something I wrote down in my listening notes, if you don't mind. Yeah. If I read that as we start, is um, yeah. uh, the album right away with just its name confronts you with a dark concept um, because Hole in the Heart is known as like a congenial heart defect, it's known as ventricular septal defect, and some of the signs and symptoms of this are shortness of breath, tiredness swollen legs feet or abdomen uh skip beats stroke and heart murmurs which are and this is from a medical website an extra noise that can be heard through a stethoscope which if if you've ever listened through a stethoscope like this album gives you that feeling of it (laughs) yep uh i've experienced and heard heart murmurs i've been on both ends um yeah, that would say this album describes it uh well. <laughs> the just like, I like the the shortness of breath. <laughs> Cuz like yeah, I said, cause... yeah, this album feels like a a, a panic attack. You're getting, like in, intense anxiety where you're like shaking and can't breathe. That's that's this album. We'll get into that. <laughs> yeah, um we we had talked before about this album and i think the analogy we had started with was like a panic attack alone in a dark room you know yeah you're kind of like somewhere isolated because by choice but you're to like avoid this panic attack but you you still it still happens because you know that's the unfortunate truth about anxiety is it comes and goes when it wants to it's a constant struggle and i think um you know this is my assumption about the album but judging from what i've read about gary um uh, i think i put it away but i have one of his like books here from philip best's printing thing but you know he talks a lot about having like personal anxiety issues like very intense like to where it physically hurts him issues so you know i think Maybe he projected some of that onto this music, such as album. Yeah, especially too because he did this in isolation, or he made this album all by himself. So that definitely probably could have been like subconsciously put on here. Yeah, uh, those feelings and emotions definitely come through like throughout it. So it. Yeah, you don't make art, you know, devoid of whatever you're doing yeah. in life. So, Very at true. least I've never known an artist to be able to do that. So, <laughs> you can definitely feel all his anxiety and his loneliness in this. So, what about LMFAO? Are they party rocking? Do they even do that track? I don't know. <laughs> they reject. Still party rocking, like twelve, you know, twelve years later. I'm sorry, sorry for party rocking. Party <laughs> rock <laughs> Um, but so this is kind of um, you know, an intense album. So I suppose if you're a bit sensitive to those feelings, you know, maybe just keep that in mind because this album, like it's when you listen to it, it's it is one of those um albums like you feel it, you feel the noise, you feel the sounds, the layers. It's very noisy. So just be aware of that. But I guess, uh, you know, without further ado, we could get into it. It's about 13 tracks with in the double uh, CD reissue. And, you know, the opening track with the, like, the best name ever. I love the opening track name. Just Bite the Bolster. What a fantastic track. Um, and track name. But it's a fantastic track, too, because... This is the kind of opening track you want. This is one of those opening tracks that's very indicative of what the album is all about. Like, it kind of encompasses, like, every aspect and sound that you're going to encounter on this album very well. 
Yeah, uh, my opinion is an opening track should be one of two things, and that's either one, a disproportionately, like, totally different from the rest of the album, so it just kind of throws you off, like, the fuck, you know, <laughs> um, type deal, or it should be, like, a thesis statement, uh, you know, outlining, like, this is, you know, a great sample or... Uh, a small display of everything you're about to experience. And so it just kind of draws you into the world, kind of like the intro to a, you know, a good intro to a TV show or something like that um, yeah. is, you know, we're going to draw you in and we're going to give you a taste of the world and you can, you know, check out because now you're part of this experience, you know, not, not whatever you're feeling in real life. <laughs> Unless you're having a you know anxiety attack, then yeah. you know this is the soundtrack for that. Yeah, and I suppose like the sound you're encountering in this track is kind of what you're gonna encounter throughout the album, which is just um, fuzzy like distortion sounds that they almost like at some points they almost it almost sounds like ambient music. Because it's the way it's, like, produced. And at some points it just sounds like pure, like, drone or industrial. And then there's these... The main staple of the album is, like, these pains, like, elongated, like, reverb moans and just, like, shouting and yells. These pained echoes throughout the entire album. They're not... I mean, I'm sure he's saying stuff. Uh, no matter how many times this is album, I can't make out what he's saying. It just sounds more like pains like emotion and sounds like groaning through the mic going over like each track that's like one of the big motifs of this album and they're so like pushed down into the mix they're totally just like completely like a whole layer they're part of the wall of sound a lot of these tracks is just these pained echoes yeah and with uh bite the bolster there's a lot of scraping and shearing throughout it and it just it sets that stage for a massive uh, soundscape that spans outward. Um, yeah. There's plenty, plenty <laughs> use of uh, <laughs> reverb and delay, and it's very well done. Um, you know, like, you get, you got to think at the time, you know, he's recording this more than likely with something like a four track or something. Yeah, so. Yeah, so each effect is like a deliberate activation. Um, if not, you know, doing one layer and then another and then another and another, <laughs> however many times. So, yeah, uh, well, great use of re reverb and delay on this one in addition to those high pitch frequencies. Yeah, and I think um, I this is one of those albums too that when I listen to music, I constantly like think back to like the album cover which I'll show you the album cover because this like simple landscape makes it makes me think of like you know kind of like the desert like the badlands like just openness and vanness and it just sounds like this like this wanderer like you hear like his voice echoing around the wind they're just like pain it, like yeah it's vast like landscape and outward and just like how you explained it you get that sense a lot from the first track and like the way his vocals are recorded you're just yelling into the the void <laughs> basically i guess would be <laughs> with the sound here yeah and that's another reason i like the uh dirter reissue over the uh og is because the og um i'm not sure if that's him or someone else uh on the og cover but like the dirter cover definitely lends better to the uh imagery of the sound yeah actually i think it's um because the name ramla is based off a camp where nazis were executed so it might be like i can't i might have to pull it up here sometime but i think it's a specific for like uh general that was executed i could be wrong i <laughs> I'm just gonna do the arm wave for yeah. the K cut here. Yeah, and then yeah, I I meant for us to go into the albums we're listening to. We can do that after. I just got <laughs> I oh, caught okay. the flow we went into, but yeah. Definitely. No, it's cool. 
I, I do want to say I want to finish up like around 10 30 ish so Yeah. about an hour from now because I still gotta hit the shower and I got Okay. work tomorrow so Dude, a third door from the left interview? I didn't know that. That's pretty good. <laughs> Maybe we'll talk about that out at some point. You want to talk about lo fi, weirdo, industrial. Third door from the left, face the firing squad. That's not one that's well known, but I know it. <laughs> I'm looking it up right now. <laughs> I I really love um sorry this is another tangent. I just uh like I fall asleep with you know like please don't hate me. I fall asleep with Spotify playing an album and I have it set to just keep on playing stuff. I Yeah. and because I sleep at you know like 7 hours at a time, I'll start off with like the well-known shit but then it gets real far out there and Yeah. so Like, that's how I actually came across uh, one of my wrecks we'll get into later. Yeah. But, yeah, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's Nice. so good. Yeah, we fall asleep to... Because I can't sleep until it sounds. I get too, like, afraid. So I... We just put on, like... Usually it's Max Mofo, but he... Pokemon. Just him screaming and opening up cards. We have, like, the... Um, the cast. The Google cast. So we just... I was going to say uh, 2814's album. Uh, a new birth of a new day, like mwah, perfect. <laughs> this album in particular makes me sleepy. Certain albums do. A lot of cold meat industry do. I can't explain it. I'm just built different. Built different, bruh. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I don't. I can't remember who's. They executed a few Nazi generals for war crimes around Ramla, so it could be any one of them. Yeah, let's <laughs> let's go back yeah. in. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it could be any one of them. There are a few executed. Whatever. The reissue album cover is great. Um, kind of reminds me of a Nocturnal Emissions album cover, too. He does a lot of album covers with, like, landscapes and stuff. Um, and it just, I don't know. It definitely makes you think of, like, the music that's on here. <laughs> Hey. Yeah, and that's another thing is like because the reissue came out in 2009, so I wonder how much that's informed the ambient landscape. use i guess <laughs> <laughs> yeah because a lot of band camp artists uh like as you go down the rabbit hole of like noise and um ambient like they use distorted pictures of landscapes and geography and stuff and yeah so you know i'm not sure if this informed that or vice versa or whatever but um you know just another fun thing of like hey like this is seminal you know <laughs> yeah absolutely um And I like when that happens, you know, album cover matches music. It doesn't have to, but, you know, it's fun. But, yeah, so, Bite the Bolster, great opening track. Um, you know, definitely a perfect, like, if you want to see if you're going to actually like this album or be interested in checking it out, or, uh, yeah, you don't have to go farther than the first track, definitely, to get, like, a taste or an idea of what else is going to be on here. That should pretty much cement for you what, what's going to be there. <laughs> So yeah, track two, Do Not Come Near. Um, so second track, uh, this is definitely like when you really start hearing like the heavy, uh, fuzzy, it was like guitar bass drone, really like the, <laughs> but Yeah, it's, he, you start getting he, yeah. the layers, it start getting, starts getting more layered and heavier and distorted. Um, That's mostly what this track is. It sounds a bit, it's a bit angrier than the first track, I think. It's a little more aggressive. Yeah, my uh, notes are, you know, droning, endless guitar with ghostly vocals and some Yeah. industrial sound samples. Um, The delay and feedback cover the vocals up and tear the spectrum of sound open. So uh, this is this is where he starts making real good use of the guitar. <laughs> yes, And um, yes. I'm not sure how exactly he did it if he had like a Y splitter to two different <laughs> um, uh, filters or something, frequency uh, split or some shit like that. But the guitar...
is simultaneously in the upper range and bass heavy and so when it hits it hits hard so maybe that's just a scoop of the mid frequencies but um yeah definitely this is like if you're a fan of black metal uh dungeon synth stuff like that then uh the heavier raw slower metals sludgier metals um yeah this track would be great to introduce someone to like noise and power electronics too yeah i agree like if you are just even if you're into just like drone or or stuff like sun sun o i'll say sun o sun o i don't care i don't care i'm gonna vibrate like a bird (laughs) Um, government drone (laughs) (laughs) you know i think you'll enjoy this i even think um this probably won't be the the last time i reference this artist or his counterparts i know for sure but if you're into like the certain time period nine snails like the fragile like the weird like how he really utilizes like the guitar and droning i think of that but like an earlier raw aspect and I do wonder, um, because Trent's another artist that likes to wear his influences on his sleeve, you know, not in a negative way. You know, we love him for, (laughs) but. Love uh, Daddy Tron. We love Daddy Tron. But um, I wonder if he's at all, I mean, this is just me, you know, guessing, like if he's at all influenced by this album because like certain aspects of, you know, the downward spot, especially the fragile, he's really playing around with that sound. Um, it's definitely, like, reminiscent of, I think, this album. I I feel like it's safe to say, uh, if he wasn't directly influenced it, maybe influenced by it, he was maybe influenced by the influences of it, yeah. because, I mean, you know, Trent was briefly a member of Pig Face, New Skinny Puppy, yeah. like, all the fun Coil. stuff, so, yeah, I... <laughs> <laughs> like Trent and Coyle, you know. Yeah. Um, so I think it would be fair to say that he probably knew this album and Trent, if you're listening <laughs> for some reason, <laughs> let us know in the comments if you <laughs> knew about this album when you were making the fragile. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Or Flood, maybe he knew because you know. <laughs> oh yeah, Flood. Like fl- Flood strikes me as uh someone that like this is He's what he listened know. to. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, but yeah. Uh, yeah. Do not come near me. Good second track. Especially because it's like it builds af- it builds upon what Bite the Bolster is. It just kind of gets more like aggressive and like here comes the guitars and the heavy drone. Like it completes the sound of like what you're going to um, encounter here. So very good. Yeah. If if Bite the Bolster is, like, the beginning of that freak out, you know, like, you're alone in a dark room and stuff, then this is just feeling your heartbeat grow and, you know, like, the sound of your own circulatory system flooding through your yeah. ears, like, you know, as everything intensifies. Yes. Um, that's what Do Not Come Near is. And it's a great warning to, yeah. you know, like, to everyone else. Like, just keep away from me, like, this is my own hell that I'm yeah. going through right now. Which would probably explain why it sounds more like aggressive with, you know, the title of the track, Do Not Come Near, definitely. And then, yeah, so after Do Not Come Near, we get the Red Caps, which are six tracks, all named Red Cap, part one, part two, and so forth. And they all, some of them blend in together. I mean, when we talk about this album, it definitely is one of those albums that, like, it's kind of hard to... D- you just listen to it fully, and it kind of just sounds like one, you know, big mix. It does flow very perfectly together, so... Um, it's it's a little bit difficult to talk about some of these tracks on an individual basis, because it is all kind of, like, one complete work. But, you know, especially the red caps, but we're trying. But there is individual aspects to it. Um, you know, we got part one, which I... Th- think that or two is the shortest one and it starts with this like door creaking sample which uh i'll bring up again i'm pretty sure agroom sampled it (laughs) i can't remember the track and i'll like post it here and i want people to agree with me because i have like or it's like some library sample door creak or something i don't know but i know (laughs) i know i've heard it before (laughs) 
Yeah, um, you're correct. This is the shortest track on the whole album at just over one minute, two seconds. Um, but yeah, it's got some kind of door creak that sounds very strangely familiar. And um, I'm not sure if it's a horn, a trumpet or something. You know, Maybe I'm not even hearing it correctly, but yeah. that's that speaks to the level of layering and distortion and everything. Um, is it kind of becomes a rhythmic mixture between the horns, the creaking of that door, <laughs> it's um, like an iron and rot the slam door. of yeah. the guitar. <laughs> yeah, the the slam of the guitar just kind of draws it all together. So, and I feel um, like, but, sorry, go on. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna say, but yeah, that the door, man, like <laughs> it's. it's <laughs> It's got to be like a point and click adventure <laughs> video game sound or something, yeah. you know, like well before it became known to everyone. Like maybe Moondi was, you know, just happened to have a sound library CD <laughs> or cassette or something. Or just recorded it. It's, I mean, it yeah. sounds, it sounds organic to me. It doesn't really sound, sam the rest of the track sounds, uh, you know, reverbed and sampled, but that, the it's really interesting because like, the first two tracks blend together, and then it just, like, drops when it enters the red caps. Like, it's all silent, and then you have this, like, intense creaking sound. Like, it's loud. <laughs> it might catch you off guard, like, if you're listening to this all yeah. the first time. <laughs> and, you know, it could be, like, him leaving or entering, like, this shack or room or just something. Um, it's almost like a threatening sound. Like, it's, like, you get... I don't know. Like, it's an anxious, like, you don't want that door open either from you or someone else or something. It's not pleasant, but... Yeah, within the the scope of it, it becomes, like, a, you know, like you said, a threatening sound, like, an ominous sound, like, you know, leave me alone, stay away, like, please yeah. just keep the door shut, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And there's another thing, too, whenever we listen to this owl, I almost feel like there's, like, a weird water like underwater sound or, like tone in the track like how you hear things underwater the way it's like mixed i don't know for, at least for a little bit because the track's so short i feel like i get that yeah way. and that's kind of that's kind of why i uh i would really like to like dig in more um i couldn't find much in the interviews and uh you know retrospectives that i came across but yeah i'd like to dig in more because uh Depending on his knowledge of like frequency, frequency sweeping and stuff yeah. like that, it, it you know he could have just been messing with a knob to you know put a um, low pass filter on, and <laughs> give it that underwater feel. You know? It probably is, <laughs> but yeah, it's very. I would be interested in like how he recorded this thing because there's a lot of mystery to this. Oh, there's a lot of intrigue to the layers here. Very layered album. Uh, but yeah, that's Red Cat Part 1. Short, door opening, what's going on? <laughs> and then uh, Red Cat Part 2, we like return a bit more, it's fuzz. A lot of the, the moaning like sounds and pain vocals. Um, and I think I wrote like music box for some reason. There's like this weird like little chime going on. It almost sounds like a music box like in the background. There's, there's something interesting going around. It doesn't quite fit. It's very it sticks out. <laughs> yeah, um this this one's six times the length of the previous red cap yeah. and uh <laughs> this is actually uh I don't have it marked here but I remember saying this is probably my favorite track on yeah. the album. Um cause the distorted like vocals are far more prevalent over the other tracks and yeah. um he he says in an interview that it was kind of a stream of conscious thing so um i'm assuming with that that the vocals were done last and so the uh, the vocals here sit in well with the mix and they complement the music but yeah there's a very clear uh musical sample of some sort yeah. maybe he did record it you know like clean input and yeah. just cycled it in but uh that's definitely stand out and <laughs> yeah you know which like must mean like red cat part two must have some kind of very in with its length and the way it changes too and it must have some kind of interesting significance to the overall like 
feeling or story of this album because of that weird sample. It, it's it's a track that kind of stands out a lot on this album. So, yeah, it's a very good track. One of the most intense of the Red Caps. Um, because then moving on from that, we go to Red Cap Part 3 and 4. Um, I mean, they are distinct, but I think like the first two tracks, they, they blend in a lot together. They could almost be like part of like one big long track i mean that's definitely what it sounds like yeah i mean i mean that i feel like that was his uh his intention with the naming convention of <laughs> you know like red cat part one through six is like these are conceived together you know yeah uh as far as red cap goes i don't know if he's referring to like a mushroom that's what i think of I'm not sh quite sure what Red Cap is. Yeah, I mean, maybe, you know, he's having an anxiety <laughs> attack and he takes some mushrooms to <laughs> help out with it. Crack the code. But yeah, part three, you know, um, it kind of touches upon more of that, this weird, almost ambient sound you get in this album. Like, uh, you know, this album isn't like, it's not your conventional kind of like dark or dark ambient sound, like kind of you know, when you get, you think of industrial, like that atmosphere, like death industrial, you're not really getting the, I don't want to say doom and gloom. I mean, there's doom, but it's not like, it's hard to explain. You get like these small ethereal moments and that kind of shows up a bit in part, Red Cat Part 3. That's just, you know, it, peak, it goes from like noise throw and then it kind of like peaks into ambient and then it kind of goes back down and you get more of like these fuzzy all the, in part three you get kind of more like a lighter guitar drone sound it kind of like gets a little less aggressive i wrote misty for some reason <laughs> misty guitar drone and then, i can definitely i can definitely <laughs> feel that yeah. yeah um maybe it's raining and then part four um it's kind of more the same a part three it's like an extension but part four has uh at near the end it picks up with uh, like kind of more heavier like vocals like aggressive or like him ch like groaning uh ch shouting like like a lot of times his vocals are deep down in the mix in this album and then the end of this track is one of those uh points where it's a little bit above the mix so you can like kind of clearly hear him like getting up like freaking out <laughs> so that kind of concludes that like part yeah, uh, for part three, I've, I've got droning sounds, um, vocals become more choir, choir like with ah, continuously yeah. sitting in the middle of the mix. Um, there are more musical elements, almost sound sampled, but they could be, you know, just part of the distorted processing that everything went through. Um, yeah. But then uh, for four and five, I've, I've just got more droning and it just it really <laughs> leans into that hypnotic drone sound, uh, yeah. repeating guitars and delays. And uh, I'm again, I'm assuming choruses and definitely <laughs> lots of reverbs. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, I love that drenched and reverb sound. Uh, clearly, I love the <laughs> reverb fanatic, but. Part five, um, it does change up a bit. I noticed part five has like a lot more um, like music concrete sounds. Like this is probably one of the more like industrial moments of the album, as in you like literally hear mechanical sounds. It almost sounds like he's dropping like metal or tools or something on the ground. Like you get this like clang sounds. Like totally get this metal sound. Um, which is, it's cool. <laughs> so you get like some more, a little bit, it's like three into four, go into five, and then it starts getting into like this mechanical sound with the other sounds going on. So it's very interesting. Yeah. And then uh, six is, uh, I've got for notes for that slowing of time as you move through molasses. So it goes from like this industrial mechanical <laughs> uh, tool shop sound drenched with reverb into just this time slowing down and stuff gets stretched out further. And I don't yeah. know if that's just turning the time up on delay or if that's <laughs> slowing the tapes down as you record onto a new one. But, um, you know, this is like the stretching of your consciousness. 
Yeah, uh, Rid of Cat Part 6 is probably my favorite track on the album. And because here, especially when the track opens up, I think the ambient hits like the most like etherealness it has in the whole album. It's really interesting. It's like the, this is a moment, because this is the last track too on the first disc too. So this is like a perfect closer of the beginning or part of this album. It's almost like this particular panic attack is done. You know, it's maybe he's waking up early in the morning or like leaving the shack or the woods or wherever he is or walking out into it that's and it's just this tiny moments of clarity um i wrote so the other artist i think of a lot i've been listening to a lot of him too because i have to do finals and stuff um is uh the ambi artist alessandro cortini um and i wonder if he was inspired at all by this track maybe not but if you know alessandro cortini then you know what i mean by like it's noisy, but it's also ethereal. Cause that's kind of his whole thing with his ambient. I mean, he's done splits with Merz Bow. He's on Imprec. Like he does make ambient, but yeah. he also makes like really like noisy ambient. Um, if you like right. his stuff, you like this. Then there's like brief periods where it's like just whoosh, and but you know you can still feel it. You can still feel like you feel good. You feel those ambient moments. That's what I get. Red Cat Part 6, that's why I like it. It, rind- it reminds me of a Cortini track, in a way. <laughs> so, yeah, and, um, like, Cortini, uh, in some interviews where he's going through, like, his studio and stuff, he's got, I want to say he's got a Buchla synthesizer, oh, yeah. which is, you know, just a strange device. That's like, mostly what he yeah. records with, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, and so <laughs> that really lends itself to, like, you know, far out sounds and just it's a temperamental machine too. So it produces just different things, even when you put the same patches in and stuff. So, yeah, um, yeah I think, like, yeah, I think, uh, I think we could probably say in the description, like for fans of, uh, dungeon synth, slow black metal and like <laughs> yeah. Alexander Curtini. Nice. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um so yeah so i i definitely feel like even if uh he wasn't influenced by this because given the release date maybe he wasn't i definitely feel like he was on the same wavelength yeah. that this track was made with um at least in different points you know so um uh, i'm not a super knowledgeable cortini guy but <laughs> definitely can hear the similarities there yeah and i like that you use the word far out because i forgot to mention like uh it, gary's own description of this album is like it's like psychedelic and that yeah you know psychedelic hypnotic this whole like red cap section like you know i i get drowsy listening to it in a good way like it relaxes me um even though it's like noisy and got some harsh moments like you know, it is psychedelic, hypnotic. It's like its own thing. Definitely far, far out indeed. And But yeah, Red Cap 6, good way to end disc 1. And then uh, now we're on to disc 2, uh, which has five tracks. And opens up with <laughs> uh, track Spear Flowers. And I think, um, you know... I said if there's any track to check out from this album to make sure you want to check it out. And I still think, you know, Bite the Bolster is a good track. But I think, you know, if you're someone who likes black metal and heavy stuff and, like, you know, drone and just coming from that angle, uh, Spear Flowers is pretty fucking nuts. And I think it's a great opener to part two. Um, and I have, like, just... This is, like, pure... <laughs> Fuzz, uh, probably the most like, I guess, power electronic like vocals he gets is in this track. Um, you know, he wildin. Yeah, um, <laughs> this is a slow build into screeching climax, and you can definitely feel that like White House throbbing gristle. It, you know, yeah. Like, the the you know just. <laughs> The way the vocals are mixed and the way they crescendo is all. <laughs> You know, it, at the time, it wasn't a staple because the genres were still forming. But now I feel like it is a staple of, like, black metal and 
power electronics and things like that to have at least one track where it's this gradual build into yeah. just a screaming climax um, where he, uh, in the mixing of this, he definitely shifts, you know, the balance and the uh, frequencies into the higher range for this track. Yeah. Uh, my dog just came in, so if, like I'm messing around off screen. Oh, that's fine. My dog's over here. Yeah. So. No, that's fine. <laughs> um, Spear I don't think Spear Flowers is on the original release, is it? I'm pretty sure it's not because the original release is only like five tracks, yeah. and it. I mean, it's a pretty concise release, but definitely nowhere near as monumental as the re-release ironically so. yeah i mean i think this track because i think this track alone you know cements it as like it should be a staple of pile electronics even if it didn't come out like on the original release uh, you know if you want to get into it i think if you want to get into like just noisier music in general maybe even drone like a track like this an album like this this is where you want to start because this is this is it, man. <laughs> this is the yeah. good stuff. And, oh, and um, I want to rescind what I said. The OG release is only four tracks. It's Spear Flowers. So okay. it does have this. Okay, uh, that makes sense. Yeah. That, this uh, Spear Flowers, which is the opener for our part two here, is the opener in part one uh, on the OG release. But it goes Spear Flowers, Hole in the Heart, Product of Fear, and Grazing on Fear. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, this track alone, I thought maybe it was an original. So I was going to say, this like, this is what cements it, I think, as, you know, early example of, like, good power electronics. <laughs> it's definitely cements it as something. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then... Hey. Sorry, keep going. <laughs> oh, no, I, I was just going to say... Um... As far as uh, like I'm, I just found a little more information and um, before we go from spear, uh, spear flowers and yeah, in the heart itself into a hole in the heart. Um, so, do not come near was not previously released in full length version. A shorter version appeared on a compilation called Otherness um, in '07, and then Red Caps part one through six were created using bass sounds from Giancario Tonellini and Massimo Tonellini over which new tracks were created. So that explains why so much of it sounds sampled. Um, it was originally released on Broken Flag as BF57 cassette, um, <laughs> which was a split release with um, Ein Tao from Holland. Uh, uh -huh. The cassette was called Nerve. <laughs> Very interesting. I mean, yeah, you know, we try try to do uh, try to be as good as like research as we can. We're mostly just talk about the sound of albums and why it's good. It's yeah, at least for me, um, you know, I haven't been into this my my whole life. Just like the past fifteen years, it's hard to keep track of like literally how everything works on the web of just noise and industrial and project how things connect. It's I, it's it's a mess just listen to the album i mean yeah well, maybe i'll get some people mad up here they're probably there and it's like that's not at all <laughs> and it's like oh. yeah i'm sure someone will chime in like uh, well of course red cap sounds like it was all yeah, one yeah. it was all one yeah. it's like oh okay thanks appreciate it yeah, yeah. probably uh, yeah well i'm talking in the context of this album how about that yeah <laughs> we're talking in the vacuum i don't i don't care well, and then uh, I feel like breaking it up either unintentionally or intentionally because, you know, he could have just done, you know, instead of six tracks, four tracks, all like, you know, equal length or whatever. So breaking it up in such a way like he or the editor, whoever said this is like a definitive change or yeah. at least a motif change. So, yeah. Um exactly it's just it's it's just a lot to take into it like all the exact information and times you know and everyone can be pretty enigmatic um 
And even like websites can get stuff wrong. People are like that's not actually true. It's actually this, you know. People, the person who uploaded that information on Discord whatever, is wrong. And yeah, it, you know, it's it's a whole mess. So when we talk about albums. Mostly, it's just like this specific release and why you should listen to it and what it sounds like. So I'm trying to do yeah. I definitely. That's the point of like the stream. I want to add in information and make it approachable. But you know, sometimes it's hard to get it wrong and. <laughs> Do my best. I wasn't there, not that old. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I think, I think we both tried contacting Gary Moody yeah. now. Yeah, and he still hasn't responded at least to me yet. So, <laughs> hey, Gary, if you're uh, there, <laughs> which which is fine. I mean, if they don't want to, I res, you know, I respect artist privacy. That's absolutely understandable. <laughs> you know, and if anything upsets you, you're completely wrong and you want to correct this, or actually, we, you know, we're, of course, we're down for that. <laughs> um, but try not to try to make sure I don't make those kind of mistakes. But anyway, so let's get on uh, to the title track, which is Hole in the Heart. Um, I think the main word I wrote, wrote for this track is just like downward. Like, you feel like you're being pulled down, like. There's like these droning, like almost like hymns in the background. There's something going on with vocal. There's like this album, this this album, this track is just mixed so interestingly, and the layers are all like really thick and heavy. Yeah, it, to me, it feels like you're like being pulled down. It's nuts. Definitely a worthy title track. <laughs> yeah, um, I've got it written down as. Um... It kind of reminds me of like early performances of Throbbing Gristle, uh, mm. like the very friendly from the first annual report. Um, yeah. So, which, you know, I, I'm not, I mean, maybe he heard it. Uh, I would feel that's pretty likely given how small the scene was. Um, yeah. I, but, but yeah, um, it, it feels, if it, it feels pretty, um, engaging on top of just being this huge monumental movement so you know going way back to like what this conjures for the uh what the title conjures for the album it also conjures here like you know hearing that heart murmur like you know something's not quite right and i definitely yeah. feel that with this like it's it's an unsettling feeling as you're listening yeah but i also get the vibe too like it's like it's powerful too like there's something bad going on too but it's not like it's a total like give up or give in like they're like it's like a it's confrontational that's a good word this title track is like <laughs> it's confrontational like this yeah this thing is happening to you but you're also like engaging it like it's time like combating it like you're feeling it or you're just like taking it all on let's go let's uh, the let's fucking go I me mean, i should just put that here let's let's <laughs> fucking go <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh yeah that's the vibe here also yeah quick note uh in the loudest possible scene he does say he knows of like throb he knows robin gristle and sbk and all that and he likes that but he says it's not like a huge like active influence on him but he does like that yeah i think um like one of the guys from Emperor, I think, or Dark Throne or some shit, you know, one of the black metal dudes talks about he loves like Bloom Chin and, you know, just poppy house music. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, you can listen to stuff and be like, yeah, I enjoy it, but I'm not going to let it yeah. directly influence me. So <laughs> um, I'm just saying that even if it wasn't a conscious thing, yeah. that's still in my head now, like, what a reef almost. 40 years out from <laughs> the original hole in the heart. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like 35 years out from hole in the heart. Um, I now feel that connection. Yeah. I could, I could totally see that the very friendly connection, but yeah, this is a worthy title track. You know, it's like the center of the album. It's the, yeah, it's the let's fucking go <laughs> the confrontational track. <laughs> um, and then it goes into Product of Fear, which is, like, most... To me, it's, like, the most melancholic track. Like, there's a lot of, like, kind of vibrant, sad emotion. I feel like it's, like, ambient and fuzz 
here. This is another kind of cartoony-ish track to me. Yeah, um, I've got listed for that in my notes. It's uh, the most musical track overall. If Yeah. not for the filter and distortion, this would be considered ambient synth music. So, Yeah. um, you, you know, it, um, like you, you talked about, he was in a post-punk band and uh, stuff like that. So I feel like this being something he's doing solo, he also maybe had the inclination of, You know what let me see what i can do you know musically um between timing and you know multi-track recording and things like that uh just to express that and so um yeah this is it it's a pretty enjoyable album or uh i'm sorry yes the album's enjoyable but pretty enjoyable track and like i said if you just turn back the distortion music i could definitely hear this on like you know a band camp best ambient songs of all time Yeah. or something like that Yeah. like you know it, it sits well there um but because of the distortion and uh the filtering uh, like you know this stays that cohesive uh hole in the heart Yeah, it's <laughs> definitely the same aesthetic, uh beast yeah but, you know, it matches up with, like, some more kind of, like, um, albums, like Warm Drone stuff, like your Chubby Wolves and your Luviums, that kind of stuff. You kind of get that vibe from this track. Um, I think if you like those albums, too, you'll like this. If you can handle a bit more noise and chaos. Um, I think, too, with tracks like this, Product of Fear, and even, like, Bite the Bolster, I think there's interesting, there's probably like a certain um, like perspective or idea you have going into this album and as soon as you turn it on it's probably not going to be what you think, like you hear like this album is like, you know, you want to get into Powertronics or like this is where you should start and then you hear like this very interesting, almost ethereal melancholy and drone and fuzz, probably especially in these kind of tracks, not what you expect, totally. <laughs> um, Breaking your expectations. <laughs> Yeah, and it um it I don't know it 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 lends itself to you know that expectation breaking because there's so much drone like with the red cap and just the nature of the you know longer track lengths and stuff overall and so um this was a nice little break from all that uh, Yeah, that's true. I mean it it it's still you know ambient. And it's still a pretty long Noisy <laughs> track, track, yeah. yeah. Um, But yeah, it's it definitely um, it definitely it, it stands out even yeah. <laughs> even in, in the rest <laughs> of the album. So Put it in my mixtape. <laughs> Quartini, there you if go. you wouldn't even know. Yeah. <laughs> and then we go on. So after Product of Fear, uh, we got two tracks left. Then it's Grazing on Fear 2. And I just, it's like organ. That's the word. That I, the organ sample. Uh, it's like totally. So we got the fuzzy ambient of the previous track and whatever. But now we got this like fucked up organ sample. <laughs> Yeah, um, so, so the first part, Grazing on Fear, part one, you have to go and listen to a tape called Le Petit Morts, um, but, Orgasm. yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, but, yeah, an organism, uh, happens across this track, and I'm 99% sure it's a sample. I'm not super knowledgeable. Like, I'm not one of those people that's like, oh, yeah, that sample was put out by this guy in 1953 or some shit. But, um, yeah, it, uh, I'm pretty sure this is a sample of some sort. Maybe he, again, recorded it and then resampled it himself. Or maybe it's one of the uh, samples that he used for Red Cap, you know, or something like that. Um, Maybe it's who the knows? legendary Anton LaVey making his bombastic music that he tortured Genesis with, apparently. Yeah. That's some deep lore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> some fun and lore. <laughs> but um, yeah, he uh, the noise moves in conjunction with this until about six minutes in, and then uh, the noise itself becomes its like 
own instrumental movement of echoes just resounding in this profoundly dark place because as you're listening to this um you know you can call it like cultural conditioning or whatever like watching too many horror movies but my mind just goes into like you're somewhere dark while you're listening to this and even with this you know organism <laughs> uh, uh you still feel like you're in that dark place and so when the noise comes in it like adds to it and then it just takes you further into it so the noise pulls you further into the darkness so as you thought you know with like red cat part six <laughs> oh boy i can't get much darker it's like no now you're in a darker spot <laughs> yeah although i kind of when i listen to the song because i picture things and envision things i think here between this and the last track um it's like i imagine like a church burning down or some kind of building like when you watch like a horror movie at the end and like everything's like dead or sure maybe like the whole cast is dead or just as it's something terrible happened everything's burning but it's also like um ethereal and like mystified i'm trying to think of like i cannot think of a movie at the top of my head i don't know like midsummer like eh. <laughs> everything oh yeah everything's sure. burning but it's like this weird kind of ethereal moment in a way it, it's this moment of like clarity and resolution yeah um i think it's hereditary like that too i don't know those are only modern horror movies i watch so i'm trying to i'm trying to be cool with the kids <laughs> um, just mention a24 the kids uh, will love it i know <laughs> um but yeah uh i think because uh, we had discussed this album previously, I think you mentioned before, like you picture like Polaroids burning or being destroyed too. When you think of this yeah, album, yeah, like you're burning Polaroids in the dark, and you're just watching. You know, like your memories go up in flame before you, and there's nothing you can do to stop it because once they catch, it's you know it it's yeah. pretty quick but it's exactly. still a tragic thing like you're trying to burn it in your head that image because this is the last time you'll ever see it um but and i guess going into the the last track because it kind of keeps that the last track true religion um it doesn't also feel like a total like nihilistic ending to there's like a feeling of like purpose like you have to do this and you have to burn the house for to move on like to get over these feelings this emotion I, that's why I, I sense these things when i listen to music maybe i just project them onto the music i don't know but that's what i feel like it doesn't feel like a total like despair nihilistic album in general like there is levels of it but it doesn't end like that like there's like a like a sense of ownership like taking over and just like Maybe the whole thing is you just learning to live with this issue and trying to control it, even though you know it's going to hurt you or doing what you need to do to just kind of, uh, you know, live with it. So True Religion, uh, a twenty uh, about a 24-minute uh, closer. For the longest track on the album. Uh, pretty nuts. It's it, it ends with, like, the pain yells, but they're, like, the loudest I think they've been on the whole album. They're, like, above all the walls of sound and stuff which is really interesting they're like sitting on top of the mix instead of being like part of it or pushed down and this whole track is just it's like a mishmash it it transitions like totally it starts from one end to another um it kind of takes a lot of different parts from the past few tracks on the second disc and kind of like elongates it i mean i think it's a good ending because i think it's like the it's closing the book, the chapter, or kind of like becoming one with like the the darkness, the issues, like becoming a whole, a new person, like a new creature, living with it. That's what I envision with the sound. I kind of get that because the way it just kind of mixes and combines all the previous sounds together. Um, but yeah, it, it's a very interesting ending, and it, I think it I think it suits the album. Yeah, um, it suits, and it's also kind of weird um like it feels like it could be its own album yeah. you know by itself um and i, I don't know it just <laughs> it kind of uh yeah it's kind of strange um it's an exploration of, of like 
so many other different stylings and everything and it's all held together by this progressive overload into just this unending feedback loop and uh, i guess this is actually like it's it's really good it's a closer because you can loop it back in i guess this is actually like part two of bite the bolster um oh. from like a previous release too so like yeah it it the way it's mixed like you said you know uh the screechings are like sitting higher than everything else in the yeah. mix now so um yeah it it's a great end cap and everything um but this one's just such a colossus that even even within the album you can separate it and say like this stands on its own like you know if you're doing a a, <laughs> a dark power electronics or drone music playlist like you can just put true religion on there um which in some like streaming services or digital stores <laughs> this is like caught untitled so you can put that on there and say yeah. like oh yeah you know this, this whole <laughs> album was one track or something you know it, it could, um, yeah it could constitute its own tape i suppose <laughs> yeah so it, it's it's a real uh real cool exploration by mundi um like it, like i said it's, it's a bunch of different stylings so um I feel like, you know, with Bite the Bolster, the opener for part one of this album, you know, you got that sense of like, this is everything we're about to go through. And so now knowing this is separated from that, it's like this great um, cohesive callback where, okay, you know, this is what we started with and now we're going to expand upon it. And if, if you're thinking of it in terms of like, the movie and everything where you're getting you know that clarity and stuff this is like i don't know this is a nice epilogue like yeah. you know, the climax and the descending actions already happened and so now you're just kind of like getting a review of everything that happened and you're still going newer places like tangents you didn't have time for before you know yeah I mean, maybe too. You could also have the perspective because the way it blends everything, like the album and some of the themes, like maybe like life flashing before your eyes too, like a reminiscence. Um, you could view it as that too. I think. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You can feel it. Like life is, you know, flashing before your eyes, and you're <laughs> just like, oh man, what did I do? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um. So, I mean, yeah, um, it's definitely, it, it, this album is one of the, probably one of the ones that's a bit hard to kind of describe a lot with words because it's such a, just a droney, ambient, noisy experience, which will probably happen with quite a few of the albums we discussed. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, you should check it out if all these themes and stuff appeal to you. And I think, you know, it deserves the credit it gets. The mentions it gets putting on lists and stuff um and i think this is one of those albums that's simultaneously like i don't know like underrated and talked to. like it's discussed a lot but it's also like not discussed as much as it should be or in the ways it should be if that makes sense like people are like, yeah hold the heart i listen to that that thing and well no. um <laughs> it, it, it's kind of like uh, and I'm not saying we're hipsters or, you know, <laughs> anything like that. But it's kind of like um, when you find a band right before they get big, yeah. you know, um, like uh, I can't think of anyone off the top of my head. So I'm going to be really generic and boring and use like 100 Gex as an example. It's like you listen to, you know, someone like when they're just starting out and you're like, oh, this is pretty cool. You know, I, I, I'll i tell like a couple of people about this and stuff yeah. and I, I hope these guys are successful. And then, <laughs> you know, fucking gigantic waves of success. Um, so I feel like that's kind of like this is like, plenty of people know uh, Broken Flag, plenty of people know Ramlay and, um, you know, power electronics overall, consumer electronics, things like that. Um, but I feel like this album is just a reserve, like, small group of people know about it. 
Mm. Um, Because, I mean, it's like a hundred bucks for a copy of the album on Discogs right now. Um, Yeah, so it's just, it's ridiculous um, that it's such a small press run. (laughs) I'm very grateful that there's so many digital versions of it out there, like between streaming and file sharing. (laughs) It's on the Bluebird. Yeah. A lot of uh, yeah. a lot of good copies in the Bluebird. Do uh, Hal yeah. Nine Thousand has a good one. <laughs> Thank you, Hal Nine Thousand. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, but uh, yeah. So, um, again, I'm not saying like, oh yeah, we're gonna make this album famous or anything. <laughs> but I'm saying that like, this is something more people should be listening to, and we've been fortunate enough to know about it and hear about it, and so we would like more people especially people just coming into like the slower, more psychedelic side of industrial and uh, power electronics and things like that to give this a listen. Yeah. And especially with this album, it interesting thing to note and a lot of noise and harsh noise uh, artists specifically um, say this. And a lot of fans of harsh noise say this, this particular aspect is that the music to them, noise to them is like, it has a psychedelic aspect. A lot of these artists, um, at least the good ones, don't think of themselves as like these harsh, aggressive artists. They think of themselves as like making some weird, hypnotic, psychedelic type music. And I think, you know, um, understandably, a lot of you have to just from an outside perspective, it's like, oh, well, that's kind of a weird thing. You know, it's not like, you know, it, psychedelic music is, I, I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> Um, but you think of other, you don't think of harsh noise, you think of, you know, completely different things. Um, but it can, there is certain aspects and feelings of it. And I think this album is kind of like a good introduction. So maybe you listen to it, especially, um, tracks like Spear Flowers or Product of Fear and stuff. And you're like, you know, I, I can understand, maybe get a better understanding. Okay. I can kind of see that. Cause it's like the middle of that, um. And there are a lot of psychedelic aspects of industrial. I mean, most of the artists are doing psychedelics. Enough of them yeah, making, making uh, these uh, artists. I mean, I don't know about Gary because he's pretty private his personal life, which is fine. That's why we didn't we didn't talk much about that because um, not a lot's known, and that that's fine. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, I can tell you a lot of the uh, the the pe- the people who started industrial. Um, did a lot of psychedelics which is which is awesome <laughs> so you know that's and fine. i mean like kevin key advocates <laughs> for you know <laughs> like psychedelic use all the time yeah so, so th- that could be a part of it it's very interesting and like i said i you know some stuff i listen to and it's very hypnotic like this album so yeah i think this is a i thought you know when you brought up this this like one of the albums we we're trying to figure out like what's the good first one it's like you know, this one, because it's one maybe a lot of people have started with on their journey or should. And I, I it is a really good entry. And even though it's known, I don't know how, like, how much it's actually appreciated, um, you know. But, I mean, I, I think, like, in in the center, the circle, uh, it's pretty appreciated. But we're trying to push that circle out, you know. <laughs> That's the whole point. So yeah, that is uh, Ramla's Hole in the Heart. I hope you check it out. And yes, check out the 09 uh, two CD Dirty Promotions. Um, that shouldn't be hard to find. Did you say the CD was that much? Or yeah, about- um, the only copy I can find of the CD right offhand is a hundred and five dollars, but it's on the Bluebird program. Yeah. <laughs> so if you know, you know. And there are digital copies everywhere online especially you know everyone hates it but spotify yeah. um that's where i listened because i listened to this while i was at work <laughs> um, i mean i can't so, imagine they wouldn't eventually issue it i don't know eventually it doesn't I mean, it, they're pretty dude, good about it um i mean you probably find I, it wild. yeah <laughs> i mean uh, there's some people that want this on vinyl and so i could see this getting reissued like, like on that. a four vinyl press Listen, or uh amlux is getting reissued on vinyl anything's possible anything's possible <laughs> if there's one thing that i'm seriously thinking about getting on vinyl this year it's amlux um like i i gave away a lot of my vinyls and so i'm like the tape do i want to already out and i'm oh, i'm ready for it. like i'm 
I'm a CD guy. I have so many CDs. That's and fine. so I'm trying to stick with that. <laughs> I'm trying. Uh, but... my co yeah, between my guns, my comic books, and my CDs, oh. like, I've got so much house space. So. Look at the, the book issue. Ugh. But anyway, so yes. <laughs> yeah, the, um, the book issue. <laughs> we, you know. The book version of Amlux. <laughs> oh my god, what what is and even is the, uh, what's loud and obnoxious? No. <laughs> no, I'm saying, like, they put it yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, I know. The book version. <laughs> yeah. You fucking um, great. <laughs> But yeah, again, uh, thank you so much for watching and, you know, continue to do this and do more albums and just have fun with it and, you know, check them out. <laughs> Everything's got a story. It's approachable. They're not like these creepy, aggressive albums. I'm trying to think of the most fucking outlandish thing ever. I don't know. Like... Land of the Rising Noise, Volume uh, 2? <laughs> I, I don't know. People think Death Pile is great. No, Death Pile is cool. They just, like, that's, like, you can approach that as a normal guy. Making crazy music. That's not like this evil, crazy thing. Yeah, and um, if you are, you know, if you do listen to this album on your own, you go out and you listen to it. Um, let us know what you think. Yeah, because, let us, you know, even yeah, a yeah e even after hearing us talk and going out, you're gonna have your own opinions and you're going to have your own insights. Yeah. And if you're someone who was around Gary or was around the scene. You know, at the time of its release, or even back in '09, maybe you were one of those people that's like a hardcore Durder fan. You're like, you know, <laughs> yeah. Let us know, like, what was it like? Yeah, you know? so absolutely. I mean, I'm curious. I'm like, very curious I love about, learning about it. Yeah, I'm curious about his. I get a lot of good comments on other videos of like people who were there at shows, so like talking, like I, you know, I love that, or just how this has influenced you, or if you've never even heard of these genres and. I, you somehow found it which is good and check it out and you're just like i don't know about this guy that's fine i want to hear it like i want to hear how you felt about it and you're like maybe it's not for me but it's interesting that's good <laughs> but yeah again thank you so much for watching uh yeah <laughs> see you next time <laughs>